Ugh, you ever feel like you were born in the wrong generation? Why couldn't I have grown up during the rise of Nirvana and the height of Beanie Baby Mania, ignoring the fact that you can listen to any Nirvana song whenever you want for free and that Beanie Babies prey on the most base and greediest tendencies of human beings? Things just ain't as cool as they were in the good old days. You know, those old days that were so good, it's right there in the name? Of course, if we were to temporally relocate ourselves to the 1990s, the peak of human civilization, we would, I'm sorry to say, be missing a few of the modern wonders that have since proliferated throughout society namely Kingdom Hearts 1. So let's do a bit of an exercise, shall we? I want to re-envision Kingdom Hearts, released in 2002, as a game that actually released in 1992, 10 years earlier. Now, the main focus of this thought project isn't so much to deep dive into what the game would look like on a technical level. That sort of stuff isn't really my forte, though I think we could safely assume it would realistically be a turn-based game released on a console like the Super Nintendo or the Sega Genesis. But for the sake of the exercise, I kinda just want to imagine that our grungier Kingdom Hearts 1 has the same technical capabilities as KH2002. To make this work, we're also just gonna travel back to, like, 2000 BC and remove about 10 years of humans just hitting each other with sticks, and that should put us on schedule to get Kingdom Kingdom Hearts released in 1992 AD. Assume our game has the graphical chops and all of the necessary coding to look and play just like the KH1 that we all know and love more than the other games. Okay, moving on. My main interest here is looking at the properties and characters that get Thanos snapped out of existence due to their being created after our cutoff year of 1992 or 91 in some cases, which I'll explain later. We'll be taking a look at each and every world and character that the actual developers pulled from the 90s and replacing them with older and in most cases lesser known substitutes from years past, or pastor than the 90s, which are closer to 30 years ago than 20 years ago, Jesus. Bear in mind, this goes for both Disney and Final Fantasy. It was an interesting little experiment, and I hope you find this rough reimagining at least somewhat entertaining and thought-provoking, because I drove myself crazy thinking about it. So let's start with the worlds that need to get the axe due to our temporal hijinks. Of all our major Disney properties, most stay intact, but just barely. The ones that shall remain are Monstro from 1940's Pinocchio, Wonderland from 1951's Alice in Wonderland, Neverland from 1953's Peter Pan, 100 Acre Wood from 1977's The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, and Atlantica from 1989's The Little Mermaid. Odd to think that Atlantica would be the new hotness out of all these properties in our alternate KH1, the Port Royal or San Francisco of this reimagining. And I'm sure the swimming would have been 10 times better in a game released 10 years earlier. This leaves us with the four Disney worlds that VDF vanish dim fade. Deep Jungle from 1999's Tarzan, Olympus Coliseum from 97's Hercules, Halloween Town from 93's Nightmare Before Christmas, and Agrabah from 92's Aladdin. And yes, while Aladdin released in the same year as our new KH1, or rather older KH1, it would require a lot of planning and foresight to have the world developed alongside production of the movie. Plus, we've never seen an entire world that comes from a movie that released in the same year as the game it's featured in. The closest thing is like Chicken Little showing up as a summon in 2005 before the movie was released in Japan, but that's just one character as opposed to an entire environment, story, etc. Plus plus, the video is more interesting if we get rid of Agrabah, so let's just go with it. That gives us four worlds to replace, and it was actually a tougher exercise than I anticipated. First off, let's take a look at all of our options here. These are all the Disney films in what's considered the theatrical animated canon, from the first one, Snow White in 1937, to our cutoff, Beauty and the Beast, 1991. And off the bat, for the same reasons that we cut Agrabah and Aladdin, I'm gonna cut Beauty and the Beast for the quick turnaround that would have been required to get the movie properly represented in the game. Plus, Beast Castle shows up in Cage 2, and I think it'd be kind of lame to just replace the cut worlds with ones that would show up later, so let's cut those ones too. There goes Snow White, Fantasia, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty. Steamboat Willie from 1928 and Tron from 82 aren't in the traditional canon, but we'll consider those cut as well. Speaking of which, I did look at other properties not in the canon, like the smattering of the ones listed here, considering A Nightmare Before Christmas is one of those. I also looked at live-action stuff, considering Pirates and Tron would be fair game in Cage 2. But I knocked live-action properties off the board solely because if KH1 didn't take a crack at it in 2002, I don't think our KH 1992 would attempt it either, even though I think Mary Poppins could and should see the light of day in this series at some point. And, you know, it's not exactly a bounty of options here, looking at you, Song of the South. Brave Little Toaster might be sick, though, if you can imagine SDG as different household appliances. Roger Rabbit is obviously my first pick here, but a copyright nightmare if I had to guess. Also, if it wasn't clear, Pixar hasn't had its first release yet, which was Toy Story in 95, so they're obviously not in contention here. Back to the main list. At the risk of messing with more stuff than I need to and breaking the number one rule of no meddling, I think we'll also take out the movies that feature summons, 99 collectibles, or a wizard who definitely isn't wearing underpants underneath his robe, There Goes Dumbo, Bambi, 101 Dalmatians, and The Sword in the Stone. 
Full disclosure, I don't think I was going to pick any of them anyway, and I don't really anticipate we'll see any of them as a full world at this point in the series. Oh, I guess we should also get rid of The Rescuers Down Under, since that's a sequel, and it'd be kind of weird to use that and not the first movie. Now, unless you're a real Disney diehard, or you binged all the canon during quarantine like I did, which I guess might transitively make me the former, you might be looking at this left column and asking, what the fuck is most of this? Well, in the 40s, Disney did a lot of what most folks call package films, which featured anywhere from 2 to 10 segments or musical numbers with no coherent plot structure tying them all together. Of the batch here, I'd say that Ichabod and Mr. Toad or the Mickey and the Beanstalk portion of Fun and Fancy Free are the most adaptable, but given our other options, I'm just going to knock these ones out too. So here's what I considered the actual candidates. Maybe I was too trigger happy not considering some of the ones that I cut, but I was surprised that I was actually limited to 10 films here, and when it came down to avoiding getting too thematically or visually repetitive, the options are even more narrowed down. Well, to start, I think the easiest pick here is The Jungle Book to go in place of Deep Jungle. In fact, you can still call the world Deep Jungle, there's literally no reason not to. The developers have expressed interest in working The Jungle Book into the series for a while, getting at least somewhat far with it during Birth by Sleep's development before abandoning it. So let's lock that in for KH92. This actually makes the rest of the process pretty easy if you want to try and avoid being repetitive in that a lot of these other movies feature a mostly quadrupedal cast, and I don't really want to turn Sora into a cat or dog thing more than once in this reimagining, if we can help it. Namely, this refers to Lady and the Tramp, The Aristocats, Fox and the Hound, and Oliver and Company, of which I think the lattermost is the most workable for a KH world. But again, if we're going to have one world in the game where Sora is some sort of feline or canine animal, out of this batch it should probably be the Jungle Book, so we'll just cut those other four. From there, there's only four options for three spots, and they basically pick themselves for me. The most obvious contest is whether to use The Rescuers or The Great Mouse Detective, as they're both films about little rodents who go on adventures. I settled on The Great Mouse Detective, which is just the more memorable movie for me personally, and I also can't resist the idea of a Professor Radigan boss fight. This one's kind of the oddball, and then I don't have a great spot for it in place of any of the original 2002 worlds, so it'll just take Agrippa's place. That leaves us with Robin Hood, which I'll put in place of Olympus Coliseum, and the critically panned commercial failure The Black Cauldron in place of Halloween Town, and I'll give my reasons for both in due time. Two major takeaways from this world selection exercise. One, I think the reason a lot of the movies on this final shortlist weren't used in real KH1, aside from the developers having the 90s at their disposal, is because so many of them seem to necessitate some kind of transformation for the party. Almost every world in original KH1 has a primarily human cast, and even the ones that don't are still largely humanoid in Atlantica and Halloween Town. Creatively and developmentally, it's a lot more taxing to use most of the worlds I've selected instead of their original counterparts. Second takeaway is that the 90s were so huge for Disney. Like, I guess that much was obvious considering that chunk of time from 89 to 2000 is literally called the Disney Renaissance, but after looking over the options, it didn't feel like there were a ton of real adventure movies that would have felt super adaptable for Kingdom Hearts. I mean, they made Wonderland and Monstro work, and they'd go on to make the Dwarf Woodlands and Castle of Dreams work, but I don't think it's a stretch to suggest that worlds based on more action-packed and quote-unquote grander movies like Aladdin and The Lion King are more cohesive with the KH formula. At the very least, I think it's fair to say that the less cartoon violence there is in the original movie, the more creative the developers have to get, which is obviously not a bad thing. I would just always rather fight a Disney villain at the end of a world than a big heartless or unversed, but I get why that's not what happens in every case. As fun as it would be to beat the shit out of Lady Tremaine, it makes ample sense that you're fighting the cursed coach instead in Birth by Sleep. Moving on to the worlds themselves, and the part of the video that I am personally most excited for, after I made my selections, I figured that I'd like to have at least some kind of visual representation for these picks beyond just images from the movies. So I actually commissioned some KH1-style world icons from the very talented Ross, aka Larkinox on Twitter, who I think absolutely killed it, given that I was literally just like, hey, make a world icon for these movies, especially considering he had to watch The Black Cauldron, the poor guy. So first up, we have The Jungle Book, which again can just be deep jungle for all you and I care, except India instead of Africa now. Obviously, you get Baloo as a party member. Like, don't try and convince me it should be Mowgli. He's a little baby, and he sucks. Baloo's gonna be a slightly more oafish beast or Sully. He does teach Mowgli how to fight in the movie, so he should be combat capable. I think a Shere Khan boss fight is a layup, which reminds me that the villain council has to be shuffled around quite a lot if we want to keep it at the initial six members, since only Hook, Ursula, and Maleficent will remain. I think you can add in Prince John and the Horned King to replace Hades and Oogie, and then it's a matter of having quadruped Shere Khan or small, literal rat Professor Radigan, neither of which do a great job at fitting in with the rest of the crew here. I mean, I guess Ursula is a big squid out of water who seems to have no issues breathing, so maybe it doesn't matter, but I think I'm more comfortable having the villains interact with angry kitty Shere Khan than bending down and cupping their ears to hear the faint cries of minuscule Radigan. So in this way, you'll also be chipping away at the villains a bit earlier than original KH1. Anyway, if you want a Sabor parallel, you could also have Ka show up, 
up and you can beat the shit out of him on a couple of occasions. I also think you can throw in a sort of mini boss battle with King Louie and a bunch of monkeys, and not to the death or anything, I'm thinking something akin to like the hyenas and Cage 2 Pride Lands. I think it could be fun to have Louie's obsession with fire be tied to the keyhole for the world, like maybe he learned from Shere Khan that he can learn about it by finding the keyhole or some other lie to keep the party occupied with this gang of singing monkeys. Speaking of which, I guess the keyhole could be somewhere in or near the man village or council rock where all the wolves meet at the beginning of the movie. Which reminds me, we need to settle on party transformations for SDG, and I think Sora can just get the Pride Lance treatment a bit early and be an Indian wolf. As for Donald, he can be styled after one of those Beatles vultures, and Goofy is going to be a goddamn baby elephant because it's my fake video game. Also, I should note we have to change a couple of summons since three of them originate from post-1992 movies. The first one is Simba, which you'd normally get from Leon during the second Traverse Town visit. And no, I didn't forget about the Final Fantasy characters, none of which would exist for this reimagining, we'll get to that later. But in place of Simba, I think you can just have Bagheera work in pretty much the same way, and it lets him have a little time to shine after taking a backseat to Baloo as a party member, and he can basically just do a big charging roar thing for his attack too. And functionally, getting your first summon at the end of this world is pretty much the same as getting it at the start of Traverse Town 2. Oh, also, the keychain for this world would be called Man's Red Flower, and I know KH1 didn't have Keyblade abilities, but if it did, this one would have Fire Boost, naturally. Before we move on to the next Disney World, let's stop down to talk Final Fantasy real quick, since that's going to factor into our Olympus Coliseum replacement. Here's the problem with Final Fantasy, there's barely any games from before 1992. We've got 1 through 4 released in 87, 88, 90, and 91. And 1991 is close to the cutoff, but since we'd just be pulling characters from it and not an entire world, along with having very few options, we'll keep it in the mix. Ignoring the fact that none of our available characters are either designed by Tetsuya Nomura or our Vivi, our pool is essentially limited to 2, 3, and 4, since the characters in 1 were more so classes or jobs than actual, well, characters. And full disclosure, I've only played like a few hours of the Final Fantasy III remake, and it didn't exactly leave an impression on me. So I decided to just translate the FF7 characters into FF4 ones, FF8 into FF2, and FF10 into FF3. FFFFFFFFFF. Now for 3, bear in mind that the main protagonists also lacked names until the DS remake that obviously released after both 1992 and 2002. But for the sake of the exercise, let's just assume that these guys had names and personalities in the first place. Replacing the Destiny Islands kids, we've got Lunith for Titus, I know it's Titus but I can't let go, and Ark for Waka. Why? Because they were two guys from Final Fantasy III. Do I know literally anything else about them? Uh, not really, and I doubt you do either. Lunith is the main protagonist of three, and so is Titus, and Waka and Ark are both party members. And then since Selfie's from eight, her counterpart from two will be Layla. At least with Layla, she has this piratey motif going on that can mesh well with the setting of Destiny Islands. The next square character we'd run into is Leon, who I decided to swap out for Firion, who's also the main protagonist of his game, and that is probably where comparisons end. Then we've got our FF7 people translated into FF4 ones. For Cloud and Olympus, I'm switching him over to Cecil Harvey, who's also a main character and would do decently well at fitting in with the medieval environment of our Robin Hood world. Naturally, you can replace Sephiroth and his super boss battle with Golbez, the main antagonist of Final Fantasy IV. But I was tempted to use Garland from the first Final Fantasy here instead, solely so we could have a cutscene before the battle where he threatens to knock Sora down. Then for Aerith, I figure Rosa would be a decent stand-in. They're both white mages and have close relationships with the protagonist, though Cecil and Rosa's is obviously more romantic than their counterparts. From there, I wasn't entirely sure who to swap in for Yuffie, but I settled on Rydia, who is apparently chronologically 7 years old in Final Fantasy IV, but I guess biologically 16 to 20. I don't know, you just age her up or down as needed like they do with the island kids in real KH1. And then for Sid, you just switch him out for Sid! That is Sid Polandina, who's the resident Sid of FF4, but also an engineer who works on airships, so both Sids can definitely share a mastery over gummy ship technology. Okay, now on to our replacement for Olympus Coliseum, which is going to be named Sherwood Forest from Robin Hood. I was between calling it either that or Nottingham, but settled on the former because I figure as a Coliseum stand-in, the entirety of the world would take place at the tournament that's held partway through the movie, which takes place in the forest. Also, said tournament is entirely an archery competition, but this is Kingdom Hearts 1992, so we're going to punch it up a bit to, you know, punching people. A lot. I do think changing the setting over to a Robin Hood world does open more opportunities to interact with more than just one character, like just Phil for the bulk of Olympus Coliseum. And I mean, I can't name like any of the side characters in this movie, but I do assure you they exist. But you can have like a whole little fairground area in place of the gates to interact with other characters, and maybe even have Robin Hood hanging out in his big lanky bird disguise. I assume he would show up to help save the day as Hercules does when Cerberus crashes the prelims, maybe this time against a big medieval looking Heartless or like the Sheriff of Nottingham or something. Of course, in this rendition we'd also have Cecil Harvey being manipulated by Prince John, which isn't really that much more ridiculous than Cloudstrife being a pawn of Hades, it's just newer to your brain. 
I guess Cecil's aim here could be either to track down Golbez or reunite with Rosa, and Prince John's like, hey, I have a shit ton of money, I can help you with that, with no real intentions of helping. Speaking of the prince, I don't really see a boss fight against him in the late game like we saw with Hades. I think it's more likely that Sora would just cut down all the goons thrown at him, and then Prince John is run out of the forest a la Captain Hook, crying and sucking his thumb never to be seen again. I don't know if it's entirely necessary to have another round of transformations for the party, since Donald and Goofy already do a pretty good job fitting in here. If you want to have fun with it, you can give Sora some crudely constructed animal masks, since there are, in fairness, zero human beings in Robin Hood. And just like in original KH1 and how you'd think you get a Hercules party member, Robin Hood just sorta of does work in cutscenes and never actually joins the party. I have the power to change it, and I'm choosing not to. Also, the Phil, Pegasus, Hercules, and Hades cups are renamed to the Friar Tuck, Little John, Robin Hood, and Prince John cups. And naturally, the Olympia keychain replacement is called Udalali with an extra jackpot ability attached to it. Make the rich bleedy, give to the needy, etc. I guess we'd also need to sub out the Metal Chocobo and Lionheart for some Cecil and Furion related weapons, so let's swap in with Deathbringer from Cecil and Ragnarok from Furion, which are their ultimate weapons from their respective games. Oh, and of course we'd have a Golbez Platinum match, which makes me gouge my eyes out as I stream myself playing the game on level 1 at age 14. For some reason I do everything 10 years earlier too in this timeline. And defeating him would relinquish the Ebony Blade keychain and an Ansem report for whatever reason. Our next stop takes us to the Agrabo replacement, which is our new world based on the Great Mouse Detective. Despite my weird vendetta against rats, I think it'd be cool to have an entire KH1 world where the party shrunk down as opposed to just the bizarre room. Again, maybe the party should get another round of transformations here, but for whatever reason, it doesn't bother me as much to have them walking around with a bunch of mice, probably because they're all bipedal, but I won't argue if you think that Sora and company should turn into a couple of rats. Wasn't entirely sure what to call this world, so I settled on Baker Street, which is kind of a misnomer since the whole world wouldn't take place there, but Kingdom Hearts does that sometimes anyway, what with Neverland being a pirate ship and the clock tower. Speaking of which, let's not think too hard about Big Ben appearing in two worlds and England appearing in three. Not to mention that Alice is also clearly from England before falling down the rabbit hole. In Kingdom Hearts, you're either Sora, Xehanort, or British. Plot-wise, I think you can just do a slight remix on the movie. Originally, Radigan captures Olivia's father, so he'll build a robot replica of the Rat Queen so he can in turn overthrow her and become King of Rat England. Come to think of it, he may have been ahead of his time as far as Kingdom Hearts goes. I think instead, you can just cut out the monarchy stuff and have Radigan force Flaversham into building some sort of device to help him find the keyhole. And for the sake of variety, we'll place that in, like, Rat Buckingham Palace instead of using Big Ben twice. But you've got to use the inner gear mechanisms of the giant clock as the setting for a boss fight against Radigan, who doesn't summon a big Heartless or go into some powered-up form, he's just a large rodent trying to kill you with his claws, because I think that's what the series is sorely missing. To keep in line with the carpet escape that takes place after Jafar, you could even throw in a similar escape sequence with the makeshift flag matchbox flying contraption. Since Radigan would be independent of the villain council, I think following this world you'd have a scene of the core group talking shit on him, like how they roast Clayton in the original KH1. By the way, all throughout the world you'd have Basil as a party member, and it's strange that I mulled that choice over for as long as I did because I was like, well he's not really known for fighting, as if Jack Skellington, Ariel, Woody, or Mike Wazowski are. That probably goes to show how well the developers managed to make those characters work in a combat setting. I think at some point during the world, maybe around the Pot Centipede or Cave of Wonders fights in Agrabah, you could have smaller boss fights against Fidget the Peg-Legged Bat and Radigan's Fat Pet Cat Felicia in the same vein as the Lucifer fight in BBS. I'm dubbing the keychain for this world Elementary, which gives a small boost to Fire, Blizzard, and Thunder Magic. Oh, and since Jasmine obviously doesn't exist in this Baker Street world, we need to grant someone else her Princess of Heart status. I don't really think Maid Marian or Olivia the actual mouse would quite fit in, so I'm just passing the status over to Wendy in Neverland. If Alice can be a Princess of Heart without being a princess, there's no reason another British girl in a blue dress voiced by the same exact lady can't be one too. And yet another small change, since we won't get a genie summon after this world, instead at some point during the world you'd find a chest holding a summon gem, and who else is contained in the gem but Figment the goddamn dragon the Proto Spyro. For the unfamiliar, Figment is something of a mascot for Disney's Epcot Park in Orlando, and I think his inclusion here would be a cool way to work the theme parks into the games 17 slash 27 years ahead of schedule. Plus, Mushu's not going to show up here either, so we can still have some kind of dragon companion. I figure he'd do the same exact stuff Genie does, except purple now. Moving on to our final change world, we've got Halloween Town being replaced by the Black Cauldron-inspired world in Prydain. I'm willing to bet this is the property that most folks would be least familiar with, and for good reason. Disney wants you to forget that this movie ever existed because it bombed at the box office and most critics had very little good to say about it. 
Like, they introduced a princess in this movie, and it flopped so badly that they never even bothered shoehorning her into Disney princess merchandise. I watched it for the first time near the start of the pandemic, and I already forgot the name of the protagonist. They didn't release The Black Cauldron on VHS until 13 years after its theatrical release, and the only reason they did is because fans of the movie were like, Hey, could you release The Black Cauldron on VHS? It's been 13 years. So as you can see, the movie has its cult following, but for me, and I would assume most people, it's remembered for how distinctly unmemorable it is on top of being oddly dark for a Disney movie. That's actually why I picked it for this spot, since it's really one of the closest things we can get for a substitute for the deliberately creepy setting of Halloween Town. Tim Burton actually did uncredited work on the Black Cauldron as a concept artist. The setting of Perdain itself isn't all that spooky, but the themes, and especially the villain, are some of the darkest Disney has to offer even to this day. Our antagonist and Oogie replacement here, the Horned King, is 10 times more intimidating, yet 50 times less entertaining. His goal is to locate the mythical and titular artifact, the Black Cauldron, which can be used to raise an army of undead soldiers so he can yada yada yada. In order to find the cauldron, he kidnaps a magic pig named Henwen who can tell the future. Yes. This pig is under the care of our protagonist, Tarin, who has all the charisma and complexity of plain yogurt. He'll unfortunately be our party member here with the combat finesse of Ping until about halfway through the world when he gets his hands on a magic sword, which does nothing to actually make Tarin better at fighting, rather it fills him with an unfound confidence as the sword takes the reins and does all of the fighting for him. I was thinking about just altering the plot so that the Horned King is looking for the keyhole instead of the Black Cauldron, but then I realized that most of the Disney villains in Cage 1 don't actually make conscious efforts toward finding their world's keyhole. It's really just Jafar, Ursula, and Maleficent, the rest kind of just do their own thing, including Oogie Boogie. So fuck it, no keyhole searching, we're just gonna do the movie plot because I really can't be arsed to rewrite this, even though it really needs it. Also, you know how some Disney worlds and KH games cut certain characters for whatever reason, like the Professor in Deep Jungle or Zazu in the Pride Lands? I would hope and pray that they would make this same decision for the Gollum John Bolton crossbreed that is Gurgi, a detestable little creature who makes Jar Jar Binks look like an intellectual conversationalist. Unfortunately, Gurgi is decently important to the plot of the movie, so he'd probably have to stay. In turn, I could definitely see them cutting one-fourth of the movie's main party in Fluter Flam, who coincidentally shared a voice actor with Jane's father in Tarzan. This change is fine, though, as Fluter's main personality trait was that he was old, and his primary skill was doing nothing interesting ever. The world would be similarly linear to the original Halloween Town, starting at Tarin's farm, taking the party to the Horn King's castle, and then out to the swampy lands of Morva, where the Black Cauldron is acquired, and then back to the castle for a boss battle with the Horned King, which is ideally more climactic than him just getting slurped up by the cauldron and dying. The keychain for this world would be called Dernwin, which is the name of the magical sword in the original Chronicles of Perdane book series, and would grant an MP haste ability upon equipping. I should also mention that since we won't have Belle as another of the seven princesses, we can swap her out for Alanwi, who can be kidnapped by Riku at the end of this world in place of his usual capturing of Jasmine at the end of Agrippa. And from that point on in our retelling, not too much is different. Our last major change is finding a replacement for Beast, since there's no Belle to be rescuing. I think a cool substitute could be a post-sword-in-the-stone King Arthur, aka Wart, aka Better Tarin. Maybe have Merlin reference throughout the early game that he sent a friend and warrior of his own to battle the darkness, and his quest finds him at the gates of Hollow Bastion. Just like Beast did, Arthur joins Sora in his time of need and protects him using the legendary Excalibur, which Sora recognizes as the name of his raft. To make matters more interesting, what if on the return trip to Hollow Bastion, Sora returns the favor and helps Arthur find and reclaim Excalibur, which he loses during the chaos of the final keyhole being opened. Finally, we need to replace the Mushu summon earned after the Dragon Maleficent battle, and I think a fitting replacement would be not one, not two, but all three of the good fairies from Sleeping Beauty making an early appearance here before KH2. You can size them down a bit and have them act functionally the same as Mushu, they can float near Sora's head and shoot out a consistent stream of magic, and you can cycle between the three fairies using the D-pad on whatever controller you'd be playing this game on, Fire for Flora, Blizzard for Merryweather, and Thunder for Fauna because green was the leftover color here. And with that, our job here is done, I've played my role, and this arbitrary time travel exercise has been completed. Hey, thanks for watching the video. You know, I had like the itch to do more uh, alternate history sort of stuff after that crocodile video. Um, this was a bit more of a meta direction, hope you enjoyed it. Um, sorry that I didn't use the movie that you really like. Thank you for your patience as I worked on this one. Uh, scripting took me a little bit longer than usual for whatever reason. I'm very particular about making sure everything is the way I want. And then, you know, for this one I had to pull clips from movies, so I had to watch the movies, uh, some of which I didn't like as much as the others. And thank you all for your continued support. Time is honestly flying by because I've, I've just been having a blast these past couple of months. 
and it's all thanks to you guys and a special shout out to my patrons the uh, best way to support the channel would be to pledge on patreon if you are able to do that um it's you know it goes a long way in making this operation stay afloat so and with that we'll kick it to a little bit of fan art and my lovely very generous patrons take it easy and i'll see you next time